Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jim Marion and I'm going to give you an overview of project management. There's an introductory lecture. I want you to understand a little bit about where project management came from, uh, what it's used for, why it's important for graduate business students to understand it and be able to incorporate it in their practice and in their careers. So let's get started. Uh, this is a picture of me, of course, and uh, this is all about project management and I want to welcome everyone aboard. So today is going to focus on introducing introductory concepts, as I mentioned, and some highlights uh, from the text uh, so you can get a better appreciation of what the text is trying to tell us and why. Let's step back first and take a little bit of a historical perspective of project management. If we look back about 75 years or so, we see some of the origins of project management uh, involved in uh, very complex projects in the Department of Defense primarily. And here we see uh, CPM and PERT. CPM is the critical path method. PERT is program evaluation and review technique. But what are networks all about anyway? Networks are really just a tool for organizing your activities so you can determine what is the overall duration of the project schedule. That's what a network diagram does. And CPM and PERT are really almost the same thing, except PERT assumes that you never know the duration of each activity uh, with precision. It's always going to vary naturally. That's the difference between CPM and PERT, and this began in the 60s. In the 70s, there was the focus on the triple constraint. The triple constraint is all about the project schedule, the project budget, and the scope. It's a consideration of what the project will deliver, when, and how much is it going to cost. Uh, that uh, emphasis uh, really uh, moved to the forefront in the 1970s. In the 80s, there were concerns about managing multi multiple projects at a given time, multi-project management. And this is because project management increasingly became the way are the means by which companies got work done. So that's in the 80s. And then in 1990 through 2005, we have an emphasis on integration, aligning projects with organizational strategy. Now I should mention that there's already been some discussion in our discussion threads and in the assignments about why is it that project managers should know something about strategy? Well, strategy informs how uh, the company is going to compete. Mm -hmm. Are you going to compete on cost? Are you going to compete uh, by adding more features to your products? Exactly uh, what mechanism will you use to compete? Well, if you understand how you intend to compete, that would tell the project manager, should you emphasize cost? Should you emphasize schedule? Should you emphasize the performance of your deliverables? Strategy plays a, a key role in helping you make those uh, determinations and trade-offs. Of course, the client does too, but understanding your strategy um, and why this is important, it, it really began to be discussed in detail from the 1990s and on. There is that old saying that goes like this, if you don't know where you're going, you may end up somewhere else. The same goes with strategy and project management. Now, even though project management was formalized in the middle of the 20th century, uh, it could be said that activities, human activities, took the form of projects uh, many hundreds of years ago, perhaps thousands. For example, the Great Wall of China, the Great Pyramids of Giza. I've had a chance to visit both of these, and I could see that there must have been many, many people working on them. There must have been funding resources, materials, a certain level of uh, coordination, uh, maybe uh, paid workers, slave workers. Uh, so there was a certain amount of planning, although perhaps it did not rise to the degree of project management as we see it today. Uh, so again, you see managing resources, maintaining a schedule. Now you would think, well, let's take a look at the Great Pyramids, for example. Uh, what schedule would be involved with the Great Pyramid? Well, it's said that the Great Pyramid was built in 20 years, although may, that may be a subject for debate. Many archaeologists agree. Uh, 
and one of the reasons why 20 years is said is a schedule said to be a scheduled date for the pyramid is because it had to be completed prior to the death of the pharaoh if it is viewed as a tomb so even a very long-term uh, endeavor such as a pyramid involved a schedule now in the late 19th century um, you could begin to see what became modern project management begin to evolve uh, for example, in the United States, we see the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. This is the effort to build uh, railways across a very large geographical distance. And um, that could be considered the very first large-scale project, uh, particularly in the U.S., an example of project management. It started after the president signed the Pacific Railroad Act. There was funding granted, land granted, and uh, one railroad was assigned to build from the west and another to, to build from the east and meet in the middle. And this was considered a project because it's very complicated, very expensive, involved a lot of resources, and it uh, involved very significant distances because the U.S. is geographically, uh, you know, very wide. Uh, you know, like Vietnam is a narrow strip of land it's very long. Uh, it reminds me of the state of California. But the U.S. is much larger, so if you're going to be, build a rail across it, then it's going to be complex and managed as a project. Here's an example of some of the paperwork involved and the organization involved in managing this project. Uh, for example, here's the uh, budgets for uh, assistance, chain men, axe men, uh, levelers, a topography, you know, because you had to understand which direction up or down would the rails need to flow uh, over, um, over and under mountains. And you even had hunters. Why hunters? Because uh, it, the project required or a source of food for all the workers. So you begin to see some organization and detail here that's reminiscent of a modern project. Now, in the mid-19th century, uh, we began to move toward the, gradually, toward the era of mass production. And we see this in the organization of labor and manufacturing and assembly. Uh, Henry Ford, the developer of the Model T car, introduced uh, the assembly line. So we see here an example of this, where we have cars that are assembled in pieces, one after another, and we have clear work instructions for each worker, and each worker does follows the work instructions at, it, and assembles a certain component within a specific period of time, and uh, then the car uh, moves down this assembly line. So this idea of the organization of work, taking larger work and breaking it down into pieces and assigning it, this is a, these are themes that are used in operations management, but because of this, this later, uh, this idea of taking larger work, breaking it down into pieces, assigning it to individuals, some aspects of that could also play a key role in project management, as we'll see. Production in the early 1900s involved production schedules, and one of the founders of production scheduling was a gentleman named Henry Gantt. He created something known as the Gantt Chart. Now, in our course, we will do network diagrams and we'll also do Gantt charts. Each have their purpose. The network diagram is a means for sequ sequencing activities uh, so you can understand which path is critical. For example, which is the longest path in the project? How long is the overall project going to take? What activities are completed in sequence? Which are completed in parallel? But the Gantt chart is more of a top-level scheduled communication device. It allows uh, team members to see at a glance uh, the duration of activities, the important milestones, uh, to get a better view of how the project is going to flow from beginning to end. Here's an example of a Gantt chart. And keep in mind, this is spelled G-A-N-T-T. -T. Uh, one common mistake I see students make is to spell it G-N-A-T-T -T, rather than G-A-N-T-T. -T. And G-N-A-T is the English word for a very small insect, a gnat. So don't get those mixed up. That could be a humorous mistake to make. It is the uh, Gantt chart, not the gnat chart. 
Here's another example of the Gantt chart. And what's interesting about this one is you see some areas filled in red and some that are not. The areas in red are those areas that are said to be completed. So this type of Gantt chart might be referred to as a tracking Gantt chart since you can track uh, performance uh, to plan on your project schedule. And when you see diamond shapes like this, that refers to milestones. Uh, a milestone is an event. It doesn't have a duration, but you could think of it as a target date. Now here's an example of a more complex Gantt chart uh, from an aerospace company. For example, a space station, a rocket booster. Uh, even this is simple compared to some uh, Gantt charts uh, that exist in modern projects today. But it is uh, typical of what has evolved from Henry Gantt in the uh, mid-1800s. Now, in addition to um, the two tools we've discussed already, the network diagram and the Gantt chart, there's, an another, there's another important tool that's a little bit different. The network diagram and the Gantt chart are focused on the project schedule. What I'm going to show you next is not so much about the project schedule, but it is a tool for describing what the project will deliver. Uh, it is a tool that aids the project manager in fully uh, clarifying the scope of the project. And scope just means what the project will deliver. Now, remember I mentioned that uh, in Henry Ford's day, this idea of taking larger work and breaking it down into pieces was useful for uh, operations, uh, manufacturing lines. It's also very useful for projects. And this is known as the work breakdown structure. And that I, the idea being expressed by the work breakdown structure, or WBS, is to take at a top level what it is the project is going to deliver, in this case, a mountain bike in this example, and then break it down into pieces and then further pieces. We see three levels, a mountain bike, and you see that in green, then in blue you see the different subsystems of the bike, and then you see subsystems under this. One, uh, well, a couple of important things to remember about the work breakdown structure. The work breakdown structure is the project's scope. Everything the project delivers will be listed in this work breakdown structure. It is a structured outline that describes what the project will deliver. Because these are deliverables and it describes what, everything you see in the work breakdown structure will be a noun rather than a verb. It is what you will deliver, not who will deliver it, not how, not when. All of those other considerations are important, but they belong in the project schedule. The intent of the work breakdown structure is to force the project manager to consider what you're going to deliver first. And then once that is clear, then decide what activities are required to produce it, who's going to produce it, how long it's going to take. Those are scheduling issues. But the Project Management Institute wants to reinforce the idea that don't start developing a schedule until it's clear what you're going to deliver. And that what is right here at the work breakdown structure. All nouns, no verbs, no activities, no scheduling information, strictly what the project is expected to deliver. Okay, uh, this idea comes from uh, Frederick Taylor, and he is the uh, developer of principles of scientific management. Now, what is scientific management? Well, remember that assembly line, the Ford workers on the assembly line? Scientific management would take larger work, break it into pieces, uh, calculate standard times for each piece of work, and also carefully uh, explain work instructions on the number of movements you should use. For example, to take a component off the shelf, to perform work on it, uh, to attach it to something else. Everything was standardized. The idea here is if you measured and standardized every single activity that happened on the assembly line, then you can be more efficient. Now, of course, our current thinking today is this idea kind of leaves out the human element, and therefore it's not a preferred system for many manufacturing settings. However, it was important in its day, and the basic idea of principles of scientific management 
taking larger work and breaking it down into smaller pieces is uh, uh, a consideration uh, in the development of the work breakdown structure. This is where the idea originally came from. Uh, the work breakdown structure originated in ideas associated with scientific management. Okay, now before the 1950s, you often had uh, ad hoc project management, which means you didn't necessarily have a clear process that was followed each time. You may use some of these tools, but you may implement them as it suits you or as needed, which is what is meant by ad hoc one-off, one-at-a-time approaches. So there was not necessarily a coordinated effort to streamline processes between projects. And it wasn't really until the 50s where uh, a focus on moving beyond ad hoc approaches uh, began to be adopted. And you could reasonably ask the question, why? Uh, you know, what drove this? Well, the main issue is complexity. From the 50s on, uh, project work, especially government work, defense work, weapon systems, aerospace, is very complex. The more complex, the more you need to think about uh, doing things in a consistent way each time, more process focused. Okay, so now we can see uh, briefly here, uh, again, uh, some comments about uh, PERT and CPM, the Program Evaluation and uh, Review Technique. We will study this in class, the program evaluation and review technique, and not just because um, it allows you to include uncertainty in the durations for every activity, but because it allows, it gives you some power to predict how long a schedule will take. Uh, that's the beauty of the PERT method. Not only can you um, uh, for example, use three-point estimates, best case, worst case, most likely estimate for each activity. You can also uh, calculate probability of when a project might com be completed. That's something that you can't do with the critical path method, but you can do in PERT, and that's what makes PERT uh, so powerful. Okay, <clears throat> And I do mention the difference between CPM and PERT, and PERT, again, that's the statistical method, that's the incorporation of uncertainty, but the uh, list of activities, how they're sequenced, the use of the network diagram, uh, those are the same tools used for both methods. So in many cases, when you hear uh, CPM or critical path method, or you hear someone say PERT, often it's the same thing. They're referring to the same thing. And one of the reasons for this is because what schedule has activity durations that are known with 100% certainty. Very little. You know, there's always some natural variation, and PERT helps take this into account more so than a CPM. Now, in the recent history, we have uh, much more software support, such as Microsoft Project. There's also a nice uh, package, free package, called Project Libre that's used, but there's also other packages out there as well. So there's increasing software support uh, to help with development of a project, planning a project, executing it, uh, communicating activities throughout the project. So project software has been a big help in uh, developing project management in general. And over time we see further trends, for example, project management as originally thought of tended to focus on large-scale technical projects. For example, you know, the Transcontinental Railroad, aerospace, defense. But from the 90s on, we see project management start to get more involved in things like strategy development, strategy implementation. There's more thought given to the culture of the organization, uh, the management of risk within the organization. Um, how project management it goes hand in hand with outsourcing. So you see project management uh, originally taking a very narrow scope in the organization, but then getting wider and wider. And why is that? You might ask yourself, why is that? Well, remember that a project is temporary, it's unique, it has a clear beginning and an end, it's complex, it uses resources, and that type of work involves 
so many aspects of modern companies today. So much of work done, whether it's internal process improvement work, whether it's product development work, whether it's doing things for directly for customers, it often involves the uh, processes and procedures associated with project management. So project management is finding a home in so many different areas because so much work uh, requires it. And it's a very useful uh, process flow for uh, closely managing uh, this type of work. All right, now I'm going to introduce you to uh, a term that you may find awkward, and that term is called the PMBOK. You know, I speak English natively, and I find that to be an awkward term. The PMBOK stands for the Project Management Body of Knowledge, or the Guide to the Project Management Body of Knowledge. So it's an acronym, but you hear the word PMBOK a lot in project management context. Okay, so the PMBOK is, a, is a, a guide. You could call it a textbook. It's more like an encyclopedia, really, that provides details and definitions and processes for managing a project. So when you hear the PMBOK says this, or what, what does the PMBOK suggest, it's really referring to the Encyclopedia of Project uh, Management Knowledge. If you want to learn how to manage a project, according to the Project Management Institute, it's the PMBOK that you will go to. It's here where a project is defined, project management is defined, how the project relates to other disciplines, and also uh, the life cycle. So I mentioned briefly what is a project. It's complex, it's one time, it's limited by budget, it's a clear set of goals, it's customer focus, now this is from the fifth edition, but the definition hasn't changed in the sixth edition. Uh, if you uh, want to make a long story short, a project has a beginning and an end, produces deliverables, and then it's complete. That is in contrast to an ongoing operation, which continues indefinitely. And there's differences in approach to managing projects versus ongoing operations. For example, let's say I'm a project manager. My goal is to gather a team around me, make a plan to produce tangible deliverables. And then once those deliverables are done, the project is over and we go back to our original work. It's a little bit different than a company. A company has mission, vision, values, strategy, customers. There are things a company does that's tangible, but there are many areas of focus that are long term and intangible. Not so with project management. It's a temporary organization that is developed to produce deliverables and then it's completed. Okay, so that is the essence of project management. It's a temporary organization. And one other thing I should add to this, because it is temporary and because it is unique and it produces deliverables, it typically operates outside of the ongoing operation. The ongoing operation sustains the mission, vision, strategy of the firm for the long term. Because the project operates outside the um, ongoing operation, it needs to be authorized to do so. Somebody needs to give that project authorization to spend money, acquire resources, to do its work. An ongoing operation already has such authorization uh, from the CEO. <clears throat> so this is, again, some of the reasons why a project requires additional process support that an ongoing operation may not require. All right, <clears throat> projects are building blocks in the design and execution of organizational strategies. Well, they can be. They're not always that way. Sometimes projects are strictly done to produce technical deliverables or products for customers. Sometimes they can be used to improve processes and um, implement strategy. Uh, for example, let's say you had, uh, as part of your strategy to grow your business, you wanted to hire additional salespeople or have a new marketing campaign. The hiring of the salespeople, the development of the marketing campaign, these are strategies that could be organized as projects and implemented as projects. So you could see why a project could be a building block for this. Okay, management functions uh, are also involved in projects, planning, organizing, 
There's also consideration of requirements. If a project is going to produce deliverables, it's important that the project team understands what does the customer require for the team to produce. And then there are objectives. Okay. Now, if we compare and contrast uh, managing processes or managing a project, another way to say this, the difference between an ongoing operation versus a project, process is repeated. There may be several objectives, uncertainty. Um, or it's greater certainty. Uh, a project is a one-shot, limited life. One objective does one thing and it's done. It's outside of the line organization. Here's an example uh, how, of a good way to clearly think about project management versus the management of an assembly line or manufacturing operation. A project may be uh, chartered to develop a product. When that product is developed, what results is a prototype. The project team constructs the prototype and hands it over to manufacturing. Once it is handed over to manufacturing, the work of the project team is done. It's at that point that the ongoing operation takes over. What does the operation do? The operation proceeds to make thousands, you know, hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of copies of the prototype that the project team made. So the project makes one thing and delivers it, and that, it, for example, is the prototype. Then the ongoing operation takes the prototype and seeks to make hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of copies of that prototype. So you ha see they have different goals. Uh, one takes clear uh, customer requirements, defines the deliverables, um, has a clear schedule for delivering it, uh, and produces it and then hands it over and the job is done. Now the ongoing operation has to think about how to make the copies of this prototype in an efficient manner, how to be profitable in doing it, how to keep the supply uh, correct. So the goals of the ongoing operation in this particular example are going to be very different, different from a project as we can see. So processes like ongoing operations are different than projects. One thing you ought to think about in deciding why you should study project management is because projects tend to fail. There's many statistics cited about uh, project failure, but when I say fail, that could mean the project is late, it's over budget, it doesn't uh, finish all of its deliverables, for example, meet its performance requirements. And over half of IT projects become runaways. A runaway means it keeps going and going and is never able to successfully finish. These are all statistics that are not very good, but it suggests that managing projects, especially large, complex projects, are very difficult. Because they're so difficult, they don't always succeed. And because they don't always succeed, this is an opportunity for you to learn about how to do it. You learn how to do it, and then what happens? You can get good at it, make your company more successful, and that could lead to greater things. Often, the role of the project manager can be a stepping stone to higher career success, such as a general manager type position. Okay. Now, when thinking about why projects are so important to an organization, here's some things to consider. Today, a company is only as good as its most recent product, and we love new products. That's what drives the marketplace. And sometimes we see companies like Samsung or Apple or LG, they deliver multiple, let's say, smartphone products every year, one after another. So that means the time frame between each product deliverable is getting shorter and shorter. So there's shorter project, product life cycles, narrow launch windows. Um, what's, what does that mean? A narrow window means the timing of delivery is very important. For example, the end of the year, let's say the late December time frame, is important for many consumer electronics uh, products to ship. Um, you see more complex and technical uh, projects, uh, products being required by the market. You see markets growing around the world. What does this mean for you and for project management? It means, it suggests that there's an increasing need for very close and careful management of everything you do 
because the world's getting more complicated. Products are required uh, faster, um, at higher quality for markets around the world. It's a challenge. So you need to know what you're doing as managers and leaders and executives. That's why projects are so important. That's why understanding how to manage them is so important. I want to introduce you now to the idea of a life cycle. Because projects have a beginning and an end, we can think of the project as having a life cycle, much like a human life cycle. We have uh, birth, we have teenage years, we have middle age years, you have um, old age and then eventually death. That's the, that is life, that's how it works. The same with the project. You see this example of a project lifestyle, uh, life cycle, you have something called conceptualization. This just means uh, developing your idea of what you intend to deliver in your project. So in the very first part, notice how small the curve is in conceptualization. This is because in this early stage, you may only need a few resources, a very small team to help develop the idea. Now, toward the end of the conceptualization phase, and again, this is just one example of a life cycle. There are many life cycle options out there today. Every company is a little bit different, but the idea is you have your idea for what you will deliver. You clarify that, and then once you've done it, if it's accepted by the organization, then you plan it. Planning it out, it may include things like drawings, budgets, how many people you need, time frame, uh, customer acceptance, sales projections, the financial model. All of those things are considered planning. Notice the curve goes up. Why is the curve moving up? It's because more people are required. More time is spent, more effort, more resources, until finally uh, the plan is complete. Now. The project moves into the execution stage. Execution is where you have most of the resources of the project organization involved. It takes a lot of resources to actually complete the plan uh, and the plan that you developed for your original idea. And eventually you complete your deliverable, you hand it to the customer, and the project terminates. Okay, so this is uh, known as a life cycle. One important point to note when you see a life cycle such as this, um, it's said that companies who are really successful in developing innovative products are really good at carefully evaluating um, which of their conceptualization or which of their ideas should move forward to planning and of those which should and should not move to execution. And the reason for this is being so careful is because if a product is not likely to succeed, it's better to stop it prior to the execution phase. Stop it prior to where all of the resources are spent in developing it. So if you're going to stop something, stop it early. It makes no sense to stop in the middle or the end of execution because by that time you've already spent quite a bit of money on this project and if it's not going to succeed by that time the money is wasted. It's better to carefully evaluate your idea early. When you do that, if you do stop it, you have not wasted much money and you have more money to save on other projects. All right, so here's a brief overview of project life cycles. Again, you're developing the initial idea. Another important thing that you will encounter in project management is stakeholders. Stakeholder is anyone who has an interest in the impact of the outcome of the project. Another way to say stakeholders is the players. Who are the players? With whom will the project interact? Who's on the team? Who are the clients? Who are people in other departments who uh, may assist you or may just be interested? Those are stakeholders. Then there's planning. You have things like specifications, schedules, drawings. Execution, you do the work. Termination, you transfer to the customer. You reassign resources. There's something that's missing in this life cycle uh, that you will see as uh, your understanding of project management develops, and that's something called lessons learned. Throughout every project, every issue that arises and that you encounter or problem that you work through, 
you should consider it in terms of lessons learned. Uh, write it down. Uh, make notes about how you solved a particular problem. Maybe create a new process. Document it so that later when you get to the end of the project and termination, you can examine all of the lessons learned that you captured throughout your project. Okay, uh, I'm sorry this is so difficult to read. Let's take a look at a different view of this. Uh, sorry for that previous slide, a little bit difficult to read. Uh, this is project life cycle and their effects. What does this mean? This is the intensity level of different players in the project. Uh, notice, let's, let's take it the bottom right hand corner. We see the word uncertainty. Notice that uncertainty is very high at the beginning of the project and very low at the end of the project. That's because the more you plan, the more you um, execute, the more you know about the details of your actual project deliverable. The less you know up front, the more you know in the end. I suppose that seems interest, interesting. Notice at the top though, the top right hand corner, client interest. The client is very interested in the beginning then will not bother you a lot in the middle of the project but notice how the interest increases again as you get closer and closer to your uh, producing your deliverables the client wants to know at this point are you going to be on time are you going to give me what i requested will it be on budget uh, so you see quite a bit of dynamics that happen during the project life cycle from the beginning idea stage to the end uh, you also see you know, changes in quiet, uh, client interest, um, stakeholders, the amount of resources that are applied, the creativity required, the uncertainty. I should point out one, um, make one suggestion about uncertainty. Uncertainty is very high at the beginning of the project and low at the end. Also, before the project starts, as you're just thinking about it and maybe doing estimates, uncertainty is very high. Because of this, any kind of budget estimate or duration estimate that you suggest is going to be very inaccurate early on. Now that's a problem because many managers want to know immediately how much is this going to cost and how long will it take. So you will have quite a bit of demand for highly certain detailed information at a stage in the product, uh, project where uncertainty is very high. So it is a dilemma. You have difficult choices. You have management who are requesting numbers and estimates from you, but you're in a position where every number or uh, duration that you suggest is going to be inaccurate. And also, the more certainty you want, notice in this life cycle, the more certainty you require, the more time, energy, resources will be required to improve the certainty. So if you want a better estimate, you want more certainty, you need more time and resources. If you want an early estimate, you will have higher uncertainty and your estimate will not be so accurate. It's for this reason why estimates in this really early stage, they're known to be inaccurate, but it's important to consider uh, the um, appropriate use of such early estimates. Whenever you are creating an estimate that's very early and very inaccurate, do not try uh, to make an ac accurate estimate when you lack the information. What you should do instead is consider that early estimates are really good for one thing and one thing only, and that is to tell you something about the scale of the project. For example, in US dollars, if I look at this uh, early estimate and high uncertainty, I may not know enough to give me, me a very specific budget. I could have very inaccurate budget estimate or duration estimate. But at least I can know is this a $100,000 project, a $1 million project, a $10 million project. I also may be able to determine is this a three month, six month, nine month, a year, two years. Uh, these are estimates that involve the scale. And even though it's inaccurate, uh, it is accurate for the purposes of scale. And in the early stage, that's what you need to know. Senior management should understand scale because it's at this point where senior management will be making the decision 
Should we continue with this project or not? So consider uncertainty and the role of uncertainty and uh, the need for balancing uncertainty with the precision of your estimate. Uh, there's, there's one saying I'll leave you with in, on this subject, and that is the phrase analysis paralysis. That means uh, you're taking so much time to analyze and get your estimate perfect uh, that it takes too much time, and by the time you're finished, the uh, time to move has ended. You're paralyzed. You can't move because you're spending so much time estimating. That's what you need to avoid in the early stage, and that's analysis paralysis. And keep in mind that if you want more precision, it takes longer. But early estimates do serve their purpose, and the purpose they do serve is for the project scale. All right, let's examine something known as constraints. This is, uh, this is referred to as the quadruple constraint, but most often uh, the PMBOK will refer to this as the triple constraint. Um, triple constraint is the trade-off between budget, schedule, and performance. Uh, here you see budget, you see time, which is schedule, and then you see performance. But you also see something here called client acceptance and then overall success. And overall success is said to happen when you have budget, schedule, and performance aligned with what the client wants. Uh, some have uh, referred to the triple constraint as the quadruple constraint, but instead of client success, they include uh, quality. Um, but I, I consider performance to be uh, more or less an indicator of quality. The higher performance, the higher quality. But this is an important goal to have your understanding of what the client wants in terms of how much will it cost, how long will it take, what's the performance level. If your idea agrees with the client's idea with this regard, that's a good thing. All right. Let's shift a bit to uh, projects and strategy. Okay, strategic management is all about mission, vision. Remember I mentioned that the difference between a project and an ongoing operation is the long-term nature of the ongoing operation? Well, you could also say that though that is true, projects can play a role in developing uh, the mission, vision, and, uh, and value statements. And the reason is, is because it takes time and effort to do this. It requires resources. Once you've done, uh, you've delivered it, you can uh, finish it and, and move on to something else. Uh, but there is a clear role between strategy and project management, both, as I mentioned, in terms of prioritizing what you do, like prioritizing budget, schedule, and performance. And you can use project management as the tools to develop uh, vision, mission, and also implement strategy. Here's an example of different projects and how they relate to uh, specific company strategies. For example, if a company is going to change a, a strategic direction, move in a different direction, the company may adopt uh, a different product line, for example. So in addition to priorities, uh, project management may be aligned with strategy in that a new strategy may cause the company to uh, charter a new type of project in order to support that strategy. All right, let's now talk about stakeholder management. I mentioned earlier that uh, there's individuals or groups that have an interest in the outcome of a project. Those are stakeholders. Ultimately, the project manager thinks of stakeholders in terms of the landscape of the, or the context of the project. Who's involved? Whom, who is the project serving? Uh, for whom are we providing deliverables? Who's funding this? Who's working together with us? Who may help us? Who may not wish to help us? These are all stakeholders, and how the project team interacts with stakeholders is determined as a result of the stakeholder analysis. The stakeholder analysis is a set of tools and processes used by the project manager to help you better understand who the players are in the context of your project, what strategies you should undertake to interact with them, how you should communicate with them, how you should engage them, 
that's what stakeholder analysis does. When you identify stakeholders, you have many options to consider. For example, you have internal and external stakeholders. Um, for example, let's take external stakeholders and a public building project. If you're going to do a new building, you may want to consider consumer and other interest groups who don't want this new building. Uh, they don't want the skyline. They're concerned about uh, you know environmental harm. Um, you know, you name it. There, especially pu public projects, have large numbers of stakeholders and stakeholder groups. It's also internal stakeholders, some who want to support you uh, with your uh, project and others who do not. There are also many uh, relationships that a project manager has to consider. Um, from the parent organization, the external environment, top management, project team. You can see from this chart that the project manager has to be highly skilled in working together with people. Because the project manager has to work with so many people, it's clear that the role of project management is not just about technical skills such as developing PERT charts or Gantt charts um, or creating project budgets. It's also working with people and communicating effectively with people. That's part of a critical aspect of uh, project management skill set today. It's the soft skills uh, that play a key role in, for project managers. Let's take a look now to a slightly different aspect of project management. We've discussed strategy. Uh, we've discussed uh, how project management can be used to develop strategy, how strategy can inform the priorities of project management. We understand that. It also tells, helps, helps you understand what types of projects a company may do in terms of uh, deliverables to the customer. But strategy also should tell you what projects you should and should not do. And this is something that uh, you encounter in project management with project screening. Okay, project screening means tools used to decide which projects to do and which not to do. There are different, uh, there are different ways to do this. The checklist model, scoring models, analytic hierarchy, profile models. Um, so when you have many different choices of projects to implement, some may have more return on investment. Some may be more closely linked to your strategy. Some may better suit your company profile and the resources you have. Some may make your customers more happy or less happy. These are all things to think about. And these tools that you use are simply methods to help you better understand uh, how to do this um, in an organized fashion. Here's an example of a simple scoring model. In a weighted scoring model, you uh, think about your criteria. What's most important? What's le least important? As an example, if you were going to buy a new laptop, what would be most important for you? Is it the weight, the screen size, the processor speed, the amount of memory, the price? Each of those criteria might be important to you, but every one of you might weight them differently. Once you've weighted them, you could then check many different possible laptops and score each. Multiply the scores by the weight, and this uh, symbol, mathematical symbol, just means sum of. You sum up the weight types the, times the score, and then the highest score wins. This is one way to choose uh, one project versus another project. And that's the simplified uh, weighted scoring model. Uh, analytic hierarchy process is another way to do weights. It's uh, assigning criteria and sub-criteria. Uh, this is when you have many different in-depth criteria for consideration. You want to include all of them. Um, you can compare uh, scores between uh, multiple models. This is a much more involved method. We won't touch upon this too much. Um, in this project management course, but it's just a more in-depth method of doing weighted scoring. Now, another way to think about projects is in terms of financial rewards. In other words, how long will it take to reach a break-even point? When money is spent on a project, 
when will that money uh, come back in the investor's pocket? Um, and this is, you know, there's a couple ways to think about it. If I invest in a project, I want to get my money back at some point, but I also want a return on investment. So the payback period doesn't really consider the return on investment at this stage. It just says if you do invest, at what point will the money you invested come back to you? And that's the payback period. There's also uh, something referred to as the net present value, which uh, we will uh, discuss further face to face. This is a project selection method. And this method, um, and there's, there's not enough time to look at it in depth at this moment, but I'll say this much. The purpose of the net present value is to compare the project that you're considering versus a safe investment in a financial security, such as a bank account. So you are analyzing your, uh, how much you're spending on the project, how much cash is coming back from the project, uh, what is the uh, discount rate or interest rates uh, or the rate for funding that you might face in your project. You have that for your project and you also have the opportunity to put that money in a safe place. For example, a bank, certificate of deposit, money market account, some secure uh, fund uh, producing a return. So if you compare both of those, um, the highest number wins. Uh, you, you will all, by the way, you will, you will get uh, three types of scores on an NPV. You will get either a positive NPV, a negative NPV, or zero NPV. Remember, we're comparing a project versus a safe investment. A positive NPV just means if my project, if it earns a positive NPV, that means the return is going to be higher than what I could receive in a secure investment and in a bank or financial institution. Positive NPV is good. Zero NPV means it's exactly the same as what I would encounter in um, a financial institution. But that's a question mark because why would you put money in a project that's potentially risky if you could put it in a bank and not experience as much risk, but the return is the same. So an I zero NPV is kind of questionable. And a negative NPV generally means it's safer to put your money in a financial instrument than it is to uh, put it uh, in a project. So if you examine this formula, you are you're seeing multiple things here. You're seeing IO, which is your initial investment in the project. Then you're seeing the sum of, and what is it the sum of? Future money coming in from the project, that's FT. And you're dividing it by the discount rate, which is your inflation rate and it's the uh, uh, interest rate or the rate of return. Okay, so money you're coming in that's coming in the future is divided by that return rate and you're comparing it with what you spent today. Higher values are better. The IRR, and I will show you how to do this later, but the IRR and the NPV are related. The IRR is a different way to calculate um, the rate of return of your project. Instead of comparing, uh, the NPV compares with a bank or financial instrument, the IRR uh, arrives at an absolute return number so you can determine if that return number is fair. For example, if you got an IRR of uh, 5%, well, is that good compared to what you might get in a more safe um, investment? Or is the return that you are projecting uh, worthwhile considering the risk you're undertaking? That's what the IRR tells you. And in general, higher IRRs scores are better. Let's shift now to something called portfolio management. Portfolio management is a very large English word. And it sounds like investment portfolio. If you think it sounds like investment, that's because it is you think of a project portfolio, you can think of it as a number of different investments in projects. Okay, Just like you might invest in different financial securities, your a company puts money in different projects so that the company can grow and make more money over time. Therefore, the word portfolio is often used. But when you say portfolio management, what does that mean? That means deciding what projects you're going to do, what projects you're not going to do. 
also of the projects you already started. Which will you emphasize more? Which would you emphasize less? Which are you going to continue doing and which are you going to stop doing? That's what portfolio management is all about. And you see here decision making, prioritization, review, realignment, reprioritizing. Uh, that's what portfolio management is all about here. All right, now let's talk about some core concepts, in this case the project manager, in our final minutes together. What is a project manager? What does a project manager need to do? Um, well, we know that there are technical skills and there are interpersonal skills required. One of the interpersonal skills that's really important is managing project teams, working with stakeholders, and uh, managing project communications. It's not an easy job, and it's, uh, it's a job that not everyone wants. Also, some project managers are more managers than they are leaders. There's that, that ongoing discussion. What's the difference between a manager and a leader? Now, my favorite saying here is managers do the right thing, but leaders do things right. What does that mean? Well, if you compare the difference between leaders and managers, uh, leaders decide uh, what direction the organization should go. Uh, for example, a leader in a business, such as a CEO, decides what business is the company going to be in and what products will that company have. That's what a leader decides to do. Whereas the manager doesn't decide that. The, manager, uh, the manager's focus is on efficiently executing the vision described by the leader. So the leader says, we're going this way. The manager says, okay, I understand. Now my job is to make our direction, um, execute our direction as efficiently as possible. Um, so there are leaders who maybe are efficient, and that's fine. But if a leader is only efficient, there's going to be a lack of clarity about overall direction. Classic example of this uh, you could see is in the company Apple. Everyone knows Apple computing during the time of Steve Jobs was known to be a very innovative company. And many people are wondering, will the current CEO of Apple be able to continue in the same uh, level of success as Steve Jobs? Is the CEO today really a leader who can point the way to more innovation? Or is the current CEO of Apple more of a manager and focus more on efficiency? That's a good question. Uh, it's hard to say exactly where we'll end up. And uh, to leave you with this today, uh, there is the saying that 90% of project communication, or sorry, 90% of project management is communication. You will hear that saying a lot. Because of the constant activity, project managers have interacting with stakeholders, interacting with team members, uh, working with suppliers, uh, developing the team. So if you think of a project manager as just being a communicator, you'll be close to being right. Now when you think of uh, specifics about uh, how a project manager communicates with the team, um, theory from uh, organizational behavior and human relations uh, will inform you that there are two primary behaviors that a leader will use, and that's task-oriented and group maintenance. I tend to think of it as task-oriented versus relationship-oriented. Task orientation, that's when you're structuring processes, uh, you're summarizing, you're uh, explaining how work gets done. Uh, this is, if you ask yourself, are you a project manager? What kind of project manager are you? This is something to consider. Are you more of a task-oriented leader, focusing on doing A, B, C in a certain sequence, laying out the structure for your team, or are you more focused on building relationships? I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than the other. They're both important, uh, but it's important to understand that it's often said that a good leader has a nice balance of both that you have the ability to communicate with others and build relationships in the project team, the stakeholder community, 
uh, suppliers, um, you know how to articulate the vision well, but you also understand that ultimately this uh, project is about producing tangible deliverables, getting the job done, and that involves strong task-oriented relationship that you cannot ignore. All right, this is our introduction to project management. We'll have two more of these and also lots of discussion face-to-face. Uh, -face. But I thought I'd say hello, introduce you to some introductory themes of project management, and uh, look forward to working with you over the next couple of months. Thanks.